Hello, everybody, and welcome to our world today, the unionist perspective. Today, we're looking at a few topics that we believe speak to a general theme of maintaining or protecting democracy. And so our, the, the, the newsworthy items that we found have highlighted what may appear to be the illusion of an attack on democracy and therefore a lot of militant action or even just unpacking the general intent of certain alliances in relation to how they influence democracy and how they may at the core speak to something other than maintaining democracy. So I'm going to open it up to the team. Welcome to everybody. And thank you to all of you for joining us. Please feel free to share your thoughts or comments with us in, in the live chat. And we will do our best to respond to you or, or engage with you throughout the conversation. I want to touch quickly on something that Adam, one of our community member shared with us in the chat, which pertains to the cycle of history and how history is repeating. And sometimes you experience a lot of upheaval at the end of a cycle. And so he said that the cycle was about like 80 years um, and repeated. Um, yeah, every time like one cycle ended, and basically we had the cycle and at the end of the world wars and right now it's like eight years later and it's ending again and i remember i do remember hearing something like that from an historian in terms of like um the cycle of crisis when i was little and he estimated that it was about 100 years, a little less than 100 years at the time. I don't know if he, he like rounded the number because he was on radio or if it was where it was at at the time, which was like 15 years ago. But it always stayed with me. And I was like, wow, it feels like historical, but it also feels quite spiritual. Like, you know, um, very much like end of cycle, end of patterns seeing things repeating and um at that time because i didn't have the tools to understand it i thought it was pretty scary um but i think it could really explain why since like 2015 we've seen people saying that like, oh world war three is on like it's like a uh, nice the end of the world like every time we begin a new year um because there is so much happening and uh yeah, I don't know if it, it's going to continue to accelerate after the end of a cycle or if there is going to be a big break and then calm. But it does feel like because of its ascension, like these cycles are being more and more intense. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I felt like um, the attack on democracy, the illusion of attack on democracy could definitely be included in the in the cycles, especially because last year we talked about it with Jeff, whereas there's like a big fight between those choosing democracy and those not choosing. And because it's a very sensitive um, spiritual topic, the choice is going to be very very polarized and very very like tense like people are not going to be okay in the middle pretty calm they're going to be either all in or not at all um because that's the spiritual fight um that we're experiencing right now so yeah i just wanted to see how you guys felt about that and uh, the end of the cycles and i feel like we could begin maybe talking about also China and Russia because basically they've been like um the regulars of our topics ever since we started last year and 
if we could talk about democracy right now and the questions that we have on democracy, it would probably be good to, to talk about them too. So I definitely find the, the share very interesting from the perspective that we've probably at the core of us felt um, push towards the ending of something for a long time. And in, in all the conversations that we ha we've had from Black Lives Matter to Seeking Harmony to now our world today, there's always been a shift towards healing in terms of ending relationships with struggle, relationships with violence, relationships with oppression. So I feel like it's probably been progressively shifting us in that direction, even though we probably overall didn't identify it as that type of shift. And if, if the beginning of this year is anything to go by, it felt like this year actually accelerated quite a bit. And yeah, you know, just from a general sense, there's always kind of this ending cycle or this rush towards endings of sorts in order for new beginnings to blossom. And I just, I feel like it's very fitting and kind of quite aligned to how this conversation has evolved over the years. Yeah, um, yeah, and besides like the recent developments in the years, I also thought that the 80 year cycle thing was just very accurate because, you know, if you take that concept, then the current cycle, based on what this person was saying, would end within like about five years, but it started like right after World War II, like you were saying. And if we do, if we apply this like American history, like right after World War II, it was, as this person was saying, a big high for the US. They enjoyed a lot of um, political, economic, and military power in the world. And there was this sense of like, especially in terms of democracy, because if we're talking about maintaining democracy today, like the US was seen as like the standard barrier for democracy, but they were almost a little bit too, and maybe in some cases, well, definitely in some cases, too arrogant about it and zealous, like they were on a high, um, just trying to sometimes like interfere in other countries' business in ways that were either just totally inappropriate or just maybe kind of just misguided. The U.S. was learning that lesson, you know, um, went through the Vietnam War where, you know, the U.S. tried to alter the course of Vietnam's history and the Vietnamese people just didn't really want what the U.S. was trying to kind of offer them, I guess you could say. And that was a period of huge awakening, like that person said in the cycle. Um, and then I feel like what we've had recently with like the Afghanistan war ending that we talked about, um, the US started to learn these lessons that you can't force democracy on another country or you can't, I wouldn't say force as much as like, you can't hold another country up um, and they have to, make their own choices, you know, and also with what the US is experiencing with all the questions around like Donald Trump and whether he was trying to undermine democracy or what to do about that. Um, it's really all come to a head um, for examination of everything here. So I thought that was really cool. Um, oh, especially with Russia too, like being involved now in like this um, attack on like Ukrainian democracy and then we started this like cycle, assuming it exists with the US and the Soviet Union, like emerging as these two like powers, you know? Um, yeah, in this melodramatic struggle between them. So yeah, I just thought it was a, it was a cool concept, but it feels like there's some truth to it. And yeah. It feels like, the alliances 
from the end of the World War II have not changed much, even though they did change a little bit. But um, it's uh, Russia that is feeling so much upheaval against the US and also of all this side of the world and China. And Japan is pretty, pretty much side up with the West. Um, and the rest feels like kind of middle about it. Um, yeah, it, it would explain why if we go into like cycles of 80 years, like probably like a very long human life for countries, it's like um, most countries are still learning the lessons of of the past 80 years and, and what happened. And I mean, the end of the Cold War is pretty fresh if you take it like that. Um, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like countries are just trying to get by and advance, but within the pattern that they're healing, except if they make a different choice, like we've seen, for example, Germany that has claimed back their power, their military power, um, financial power, etc. Um, except for that, like they're still evolving inside the pattern that they're healing. So it's pretty interesting. Um, I would say China. I don't really know China. Um, in the Cold War, they were with Russia, but at the same time, they didn't have all of the same values. And it really always felt since the beginning of the 80s that they worked through opportunism. And I feel like that's the same, it just took a different, um, maybe appearance right now. It feels like talking with Ukraine, um, talking with African countries, talking with the Middle East, with Russia, it all feels like they're just trying to get into all these positions to have, I don't know, some kind of knowing, some kind of uh, implantation in the world in a way that they didn't have before or that they want to expand. And I'm not sure what it is exactly, but um, yeah, they can try to do it very like directly or maybe indirectly when we see that they got like spies or, um, you know, spy drones flying all over Western countries or things like that. Um, but yeah, how do you guys feel about what China is doing right now? I feel like it's uh, less political and opportunistic in some countries but yeah yeah it feels it feels like the the 80 year cycle kind of corresponds to them too in a way it just in a very different way than the u.s but it feels like now there's kind of their their game of control is somewhat unraveling like when we talked about the chinese housing market and financial market kind of entering a much less stable period um and also with taiwan um well with them trying to assert more control over taiwan or and then taiwan continuing to say no to that i feel like china also has really tried to to me it feels like kind of a grasping energy like being like, what country can I buy out? Like what country can I like basically leverage into being my pawn or being my ally? How can I maintain my grasp on like what I've been seeking basically? And it kind of, um, it, it kind of, well, it's true. Yeah, <laughs> but I know it sounds funny, but I mean, it's true. Like they're trying, it's a very grasping energy, mm -hmm. but it kind of corresponds to how like, you know, at the end of World War II, China, uh, if this were the beginning of, that were the beginning of the cycle, 
how, you know, that's when the People's Republic of China was founded and Mao announced like communist China is born and um, there was a lot of idealism there, you know, it, that was more of a high of like, we, um, we say that we're going to have all of this really cool and awesome stuff, but we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily aware of where we're actually at and what it would take for us to get there. And that corresponded to Mao's great leap forward and the cultural revolution, which were attempts at him to like try to control society into being what he said it would be. Um, and that wasn't working, but over time, more moderate reformers were like, okay, let's take more of a middle path here. And it kind of, like you said, Yurene, it kind of went from this um, really bizarre cult of personality opportunity, I mean, idealism with Mao to like, you said, very opportunistic, you know? And it's just interesting how not only do we see this whole development, but also um, Xi Jinping is also trying to brand himself as being kind of like the next Mao, like this big cult of personality guy. I just thought that was a really interesting development, you know? Yeah, and that, what you brought up makes me think about what we talked about maybe last month. I, we, someone posted an article about China and how they're kind of going through a similar thing like they did with Mao Zedong where they're denying parts of their history and there's just like certain aspects um, from that time that the country hasn't like fully digested, I think, or like fully even, you know, reconciled. And so it's, and I think now with this whole partnership with uh, Russia, I, I, I agree, like, it's kind of like, just like, well, who can we latch on to, you know, kind of get our goals met or our, their own perceived needs met? Because I, I feel like China's trying to establish itself as like, you know, a dominant world power, like very interconnected with trade and just like business technology, you know, they're going to all these different countries and, uh, you know, making housing and like all this construction that they're involved in. Um, I think in the like Middle East, especially there's a few countries, um, but yet they're still dealing with things that they've been dealing with since like that beginning of that cycle, if you want to put it that way. So I wonder if it's like the China specifically is like in this place where they're trying to reconcile that to kind of see where they land, where they move forward. You know, is it and then like, you know, I don't, and then like in terms of like who they choose to like be allies with, because I, I feel like Russia's always, at least for Americans, is always like demonized as like a real threat to democracy. And there's always been, you know, like we pointed out, like this like Russia US thing. And it's so pervasive, like even in movies, like like the Marvel movies, I don't know if you guys watch those, but the threat is always German or Russian. I don't know if you've picked up on that, but it's, yeah, like it's, it's so, it's pervasive, but, but putting it in the context of that, the TikTok that Adam shared, like it could be just like these patterns coming up again so they can be resolved. And so it's like a fresher energy once that next, that next cycle begins. Well, you so know, one of the things that I remember, Ooh, sorry. sorry, yeah. So one of the things I remember is at the very beginning of initiating our world today as a discussion, and that when it was still seeking harmony, the initiation of seeking harmony, we had a significant conversation around China's play in the world and what they are actually doing. And yes, definitely establish things themselves as an emerging superpower. But then at the same time, if you put it in, if you, if you, if you look at it through the lens of unionism, 
what's happening is that the inner work is actually not being done and there's a lot of outer work. So they're showing a lot of work in supposed work in terms of aligning themselves or supposedly brokering peace or supposedly trying to be the, this picture of the of somebody that is able to get people around the table to talk about the issues. But back at the ranch, the house is falling down. The bank is falling down. The culture is falling down. So there's a lot of farcical expansion outwardly, but inwardly, it feels like there's a bit of an implosion happening. And so there's crisis after crisis after crisis hitting them because you it, literally the picture is of it focusing on the outside as opposed to on the inside. So I, I just, I find it a, a very interesting space that they're in because one of the things we did discuss was how they have actually innovated at the, at the expense of themselves. And now you're finding parts of their culture being hidden or for lack of a better phrase, whitewashed. You find the banking system falling down because of providing loans to significant construction companies that have not been able to follow through on the supply. And those two things are a significant challenge from an economic point of view, given that property is probably one of the faster growing and best investment classes from an appreciation point of view. So, so China is literally being its own worst enemy while pretending to get enemies around the table to talk to each other. There's a, there's, a very, there's a very farcical dynamic happening here. I just wanted to say Marvel was created in the 60s. Uh, so <laughs> it was right in the smack yeah. in the middle of like, Russia is our enemy. Oh my God. Um, also, I don't think uh, Xi Jinping is that far from Ma Mao. We say from an external point of view that is trying to incarnate Mao again. But what I do feel like is that the country has never been out of that ideal from 1949 of like, okay, we're gonna have a grand communist nation and it's going to be grand event grand and yeah I feel like the methods just adapted to how the how the world system works today but it's always been that way I feel and so as long as it is going to be that way Xi Jinping is not going to see any wrongdoing is going to see well this is what we instated as China, we are going to continue there. And um, the thing is that political culture doesn't really care about like people from the inside because there are a lot of crises at the time already, like very, very poor uh, counties and regions in China and still today. And uh, yeah, it's just, I think like we're coming full circle here on the discussion because it didn't really make sense some of these decisions for us. But now that we see this in a way like, oh yeah, culturally there are still things that are not clear. Internally there are things that are not clear. 
the like the government has kept this ideal and he will keep on going with this ideal until like it can't anymore and i think even further down the road so yeah it doesn't feel that far off that it's trying to incarnate Mao again it's just trying to um keep was what Mao has instated and i think that makes sense from the question that Jeff asked us last year about like, do you not think that um, Xi Jinping or Putin are thinking that they're bringing peace from, from their point of view? And from what we're discussing today, I would say yes. Like, yeah, for them, it's like peace because that's their culture that they're bringing. It feels like, or it feels like they're saving our country you know even though we know we see that it's not but yeah we just have to have compassion for the patterns that people are not seeing in themselves yeah i was going to mention i feel like russia is in the same similar pattern that china is in where they're you know outwardly trying to be different and you know putting on maybe like a, a more progressive, you know, facade, but really a lot of it feels like they're trying to like get back to the USSR, like the Soviet Union, like so much of what Putin, I feel like does, you know, kind of feels like he wants to be Lenin or, you know, even Stalin with like some of the denial tactics. I mean, I don't know if he's gone as far as Stalin did with just like literally erasing people from pictures like they didn't <laughs> ever exist. Um, but it's, it, it's this, I feel like it's a similar energy. Like there's still this attachment to, you know, the Soviet Union, Mother Russia, like bringing and having all these Soviet bloc countries being part of that, which is like basically the issue with Ukraine right now is that Parts of Russia refuse to let it go, but, you know, but even within Ukraine, there's Ukrainian people that still kind of don't want to let go of that time when Ukraine was part of, you know, the Soviet Union. And so there's like this, it's like the same one foot out, one foot in, and almost Russia may also be like its own worst enemy in, in a way, because I don't really feel like it fully allows its culture to like flourish um, and to take on like a different form, you know, and to just let it kind of blossom in its, in the own natural way that it's supposed to. I feel like there's constantly this manipulation to try to get it back to what it once was. Yeah, and I also, I also resonate with like Yorin was saying, um, China never let go of that Mao Maoist energy fully, just changed the form. I feel like Russia never let go of the Stalinist energy. Um, it just kind of changed form. It Stalin and Putin and then Mao and, and she are like really big, loud, like imposing people. And all the people in between were kind of very like muted, like um, kind of more like, let's just get things done in the background kind of energy. But these are like really big personalities kind of, which is interesting. And yeah, I feel like it's always kind of been the same. I mean, looking at, like you said, like you were saying, like, how uh, Putin and the Russian media has been talking for like the entire forever. It all sounds like the Soviet Union, like their propaganda is like all, it, it's the same like gaslighting since like the 1920s, if not earlier, I don't know too much about before that. And it's all the same. So yeah, I agree, but I feel like maybe this is kind of like an intensification of like the same thing, you know? And Putin is kind of like the figurehead of that because he's another like big personality. 
type of person. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, and all of that is under the guise of democracy, but both of them ended up competing against themselves in the end of all electoral procedures, if I remember correctly. So I want to say any like false news, but it feels like it's not even even that is like elected until you die or something or on power until you die kind of energy. And uh, that's really the contrary of what the democracy, the definition of democracy basically. So yeah, there's probably a lot to unpack there uh, before another time, but yeah, it will be interesting to to unpack how this is going in. It is still like a repetition of the cycle. And what is a repetition of the cycle? It like, it explains even more why Russia is losing their shit every time um, NATO is advancing or the European Union is advancing, as they would say. Um, I feel like, yeah, it's like they're stuck in that 70s energy of like, oh my God, like the enemy is at our door and we must do things to protect that. Or even like it's taking our land because some are, are like ex-USSR um, satellites, things like that. So Finland has always been kind of weird because it's not like over Scandinavian um, countries. It's more linked to the history of Russia. They have like languages that are in common, borders that are very thin. And uh, I think that's why we're seeing them kind of strengthening the border after entering NATO. Um, I think like there's a contrast that the border is very was very transparent to a point and probably a bit leaky. It feels like a leak of energy there. And maybe that's why they wanted to um, to enter NATO finally um, to kind of protect themselves and, and change their paradigm finally, because they've been like, it's been centuries since they've been like not undertaken by Russia. So like they want their independence for good, so they're claiming their power and they're claiming their own democracy. Maybe that's not to, to the taste of Russia, so yeah. Yeah, I was um, listening to this um, uh, historical you know, video about Finland and Russia, and it had been Russia's policy since like, 1800 basically to try to um neutralize finland like just keep finland from attacking and keep finland either dependent on russia controlled by russia or checkmated in a way where they couldn't attack russia because finland is like right up against saint petersburg which was a huge significant city for them and part of the reason why like the capital during the Soviet times was moved from St. Petersburg to uh, Moscow was because they didn't want Finland to attack the capital. You know, that's been like the whole thing. And it's been kind of a great talking point for Russian leaders for 200 years plus to say that, look, Finland, they're kind of aggressive. Therefore, I have the right to control you. Like that's that's been the message. Basically, Russian state has always been like, we have all these people trying to invade and take our territory, and therefore I need to control you. You know, like that's always been their mantra, which is ironic since Russia is like so huge. Like anyone who went invaded would just get lost wandering the steppes and the taiga. So, I mean, obviously we have maps, but I just find it funny that they're like that. <laughs> but, it's just ironic, but the point I was making though is that now, so Finland, so Finland, like coming out of World War II, was kind of I feel 
um, had to like build up its own defenses and kind of um, just fall in with the allies because during World War II, they had collaborated with Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union because they saw the Soviet Union as such a threat to them, probably rightfully so seeing it that way, but they collaborated with Nazi Germany at the time. Um, and then afterward, they were kind of folded in with the allies and it was like, okay, whatever, you know, just cope, be, don't, yeah, just be our ally, you know, of the democratic countries. And then now you finally see Finland like getting out of this kind of like gray zone where they're like, we kind of allow Russia to um, have a threatening posture toward us, but we also don't to now they're like defin definitively doing these things like reinforcing the border and being part of NATO and, you know, really cooperating with the Western allies more. And so I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Something that struck me as quite interesting was that just the, the almost the, the parallel politics that Russia and China are running. So China has not been as aggressive with uh, what's the Taiwan as Russia has been with the Ukraine. But at the same time, you can literally almost, if you were to take these two molds of their politics and overlay it, you would see some very direct parallels. You would see some very direct parallels in how they are managing the narrative around anything that happens in their nation, how they are managing the narrative around anything that, in, any information that's shared with the rest of the world. There's very much a blueprint that these two countries are following that one has to wonder if that blueprint was conjointly designed or not. What has been the long play here? Because the parallels are too striking for there not to have been a relationship for a much longer term than what we initially may have envisaged. So again, you know, the, 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 those patterns always come through, but you kind of have to look at it. You, you have to be cognizant that things cannot be so similar if it wasn't jointly designed and decided. And how long have they been running this form of political agenda that we are only now really becoming much more astute to? That's a good point, because even like from a geographic standpoint, I mean, Russia and China basically make make a majority land wise of you know, that part of the globe. And so it, it doesn't feel that far-fetched to think that there's like a, a bigger agenda maybe that's been going on longer than we're even like really fully aware of. I mean, we literally, um... We learn that they were cooperating for arms in a Pentagon lit Pentagon leakage. So not surprised there um, to follow, but I, I don't think a lot of people are surprised about that. Yeah. I feel though a connection a little bit. I don't know if we want to shift gears though, yeah. but Nadia, if you want to say something about this, I don't want to change it up. I just found it interesting that they hid the weapons that they were giving to China. I mean, if you're going to go about, of course, it was information that they didn't want leaked, but if you're going to go about it, might as well give the weapons like, like why hide it, you know? Um, of course, there is like protection and issues like that, but it was a hiding energy, I felt. And another thing that was interesting- Which is, which is why I'm asking how much more has been hidden. Right, 
Right. Because it's like, if you're not going to stand up and just stand up on your decisions, what has been happening behind doors? Well, they were in a discussion with Ukraine as well. Probably wouldn't have passed very well if they knew that in 2023 at the same time as the discussion, they were collaborating so closely with Russia. Mm. Yeah, that's shady. <laughs> um, another thing that like came up was like, you're only as strong as your yeah, uh, weakest link. And the way Russia and China treat their people as like disposables, I found that like, that was the inner work that they really needed to take care of, whether it was like work and slave labor or just sending people into the army. It was, um, yeah, that's, that's what I felt was very similar between them. And it also reflects on like, well, what is America doing with um, its people and how it's erasing um, Andia, the news that you posted about Rosa Park, like, you know, how we're treating our people. So, yeah, that's yeah. actually what I wanted to pivot to because I felt like, I feel like there's a lot of parallels. Um, more so in like going back to the, the cycles that, that TikTok that Adam posted about the different 80 year cycles that we have. And, you know, I feel like post-World War II was like a critical time point for like black Americans um because you know that was also like a couple decades after the that war ended like the civil rights movement started like the roots of that started developing and I feel like very much like black Americans were trying to establish themselves like politically to have a voice to have representation and then you know now with the the National Urban League like recently releasing that study that just shows you know the the prevalence the an amount of like censorship and suppression of black history in this country like i feel like there is a like a, a repetition once again of like a very similar pattern um where within this context specifically black americans feel like there's a threat to like their democracy that they're not being represented um and i mean it's not even just black americans there's a lot of groups in this country that feel that way but this pattern specifically i think with black americans is like coming up again hopefully to be resolved um but like you know, i don't know sometimes you wonder because the whole debate about the uh critical race theory and not being able to like talk about um history in like uh, a truthful way which you know people always label you as being like overly harsh or critical or like crazy liberal just because you speak the truth <laughs> it's like you know like that's that's what happened guys i don't know <laughs> why you're denying it um but you know like because being and being in texas and teaching in texas and teaching criminal justice related things like I feel, and you know, nothing's been passed, thankfully, but I mean, there's like public school systems here where there's just moms in the PTAs like make a stink over some book. There was some comic book, like a child's comic book where the, the main character was like a black boy or something. And some mom in, I think a school in Texas, you know, got upset about it. Cause she was saying that it's like teaching critical race theory because it's discussing like experiences that are, you know, maybe different than like the mainstream. Um, so it's, it's weird how things have changed, you know, it, like we've, we've gotten to a place where I, I feel like a lot of people are aware of the history of, you know, and especially as it relates to like the criminal justice system. I mean, there's like so many documentaries, there's so much out there just about the you know the legacy of slavery and how Jim Crow and all that stuff still kind of not kind of it does influence us today but yet there's like this op like it, once again it feels like a hiding energy like they just you know people just do not want to open that box 
and just look at it. And they, they come up with all these crazy excuses not to look at it and make all, you know, critical race theory is a threat to some people's democracy, which to me, you know, it's, it, it doesn't make sense. And then on the back end, black Americans feel like they're threatened in their democracy. So there's like all these groups that are just, everyone's just scared and everyone feels like the, their democracy, which to me sounds like safety, like their safety basically is like their stability is being taken away, but that's not really in truth what's happening. It, it's, it's because there's no union, you know, there's, there's no like harmony among all these different parts that perceive themselves as separate. When, when in truth that we know as unionists, like not, there is no separation that does not exist anywhere in nature. Um, but we've created a world, especially like a political world where that separation is like necessary to create policies or, you know, whatever, regulations, whatever you want to call it. So, so my question to the American people in the group right now is that seems like a lot of this whitewashing is being driven by the Republican Party. So I, I have to kind of wonder what the dynamic is of the Republican Party to their relationship with democracy and their, their relationship with having the truth prevail at the core. Because for me, the hiding energy would lead to a pattern of history repeating itself. Because what then happens is, as opposed to remembering the gains that have been made throughout all these cycles, new gains are going to need to be made to almost reintroduce the equality and the fairness and all of those other things. So it kind of feels like it's leading, like the hiding energy would lead to a reinvigorated struggle of some sort. Yeah, I, I really, uh, I agree with that. And it's kind of like how um, during like leading up to the Civil War uh, in the United States, not to say that these are the same situations, but kind of some similar energy. The, the Republican Party at the time was known as the Party of Emancipation. And they were appealing to people who didn't want slavery in the US, partly for moral reasons, but mainly for economic reasons because slave labor undercuts wage labor. So it wasn't the purest, but there were some people who felt that. And the Democratic Party was the party of the South and of the status quo. And then that all flipped, um, you know, within this last 150 years. I feel like, um, but the Republican and Democratic parties were able to survive through because after the Civil War and emancipation, um, there these ideologies of white supremacy and authoritarianism were like still alive in the U.S. But the thing that's happening now is that the the ideologies of racism and um, in some and authoritarianism too um, are really being brought to the surface and looked at and called out nowadays. And so if there's a party that really caters to some of those things some of the time, not, not all of the time, but a, a lot of the time, then that party would feel really threatened because the population and the consciousness is just really changing, you know, to try to try to phase out and purify ourselves of these things. So if, if the Republican party is trying to tie itself to things like this, like racism and authoritarianism, um, then that means that they feel existentially threatened because that those ideologies are, are trying to be, are being purified out. So it makes sense that they could, there could be feelings of we need to suppress democracy because 
the population's consciousness is changing and so they will vote differently you know what I mean like I feel like that's how I feel about it and if you guys feel like that's like really partisan let me know but I honestly feel like it's it's the truth you know because I was going to say something more partisan than that but I mean, yeah I just, well I just feel like the Republican Party doesn't even care about truth anymore like they're just pushing all this craziness and it's for their own self-fulfilling agenda to keep yeah. themselves alive because they feel so threatened. Like, I feel like 20 years ago, like the, or, or more like the Republican party was and the democratic party were not so at odds and like yeah. so different, but now you look at them and it's like, I feel like if you are choosing like what the Republican party is presenting, like, what are you doing? Like, don't do that, you know? That's yeah. What I'm seeing. I, I feel like I'm, I, I agree with Granville and Isaiah, but I would say, and this is a very recent discovery, but it's not about being threatened for the political people. The general public and the media probably a little bit about being threatened and so separating there and not being unified and feeling like, their democracy is attacked when someone else is being looped at or highlighted. But um, I was researching um, the Pentagon leakage and discord and how it was linked and the consequences that it's going to have on TikTok. And I um, went back to Representative Jeff Jackson, but we, whose videos we've seen in the past few weeks because he explained like the the bank crisis and several things that we've discussed in our chat. And, um, well, <laughs> I didn't know what to make of the video that I saw at the time, but I was like, oh my God, I trust you. Like, if you, if you want me to, like, explain this live, we will. But basically, it was saying that, um, Republicans are being fake angry. Um, because in public hearings and private hearings, they behave very differently. They're very composed and calm in private hearings when they're very angry, yelling, and almost irrational in public hearings. And that is the case because basically they have, in addition to having sponsorship from some lobbies, they have sponsorships from media outlets and creating rage in their audience and separation keeps the audience there for the media outlets. So they have a sponsorship to keep the media interested and to keep the audience towards Congress. And so it's like, they're not even angry at some of the things that they're saying, of course, like there's a core of like they believe what they're doing, but the anger that is represented in Fox News is not the anger of a political party. It's made to put oil into the fire of like people, normal people, to get them to to be interested and have audiences, and so. In that way, like we're keeping people angry and separating it instead of unified. So basically, I say don't blame the people um, when they just think that they're going, they're being informed by seemingly outraged political people that care about them. It's not their fault. It's like, well, it's literally money. It's money. It's uh, it's not even like about fear for them. And I was like, okay, this makes sense, but I didn't, it didn't really click at first that, oh, but then like exactly what you said, Isaiah, what is the truth? Do they care about truth? And in that sense, where is democracy in this? You know? And then it all clicked and it was like, what the hell? But yeah. It's, um, I don't even know what to say anymore about that, but it's just, <laughs> it's just so outrageous to me. It's like, 
Yeah. I feel like you're hitting on a greater problem with just American politics in general. There's a lot of money involved and a lot of exchange of money. And especially when it comes to like campaigning and getting votes. I mean, with, with the lobbies and the, the combination of all the lobbyists and all the different lobbies and then the media, I feel like those two entities really influence a lot of politicians, which therefore influence the voters. Um, and like big lobbies like the NRA, NRA, the National Rifle Association is like one that comes to mind or even like, you know, the soybean corp, like uh, corn, I forgot which lobby they're in, but um, Monsanto is one big company that's like behind ensuring that they have control over like all the seeds, basically all the seeds in the United States. And so there's all these things, all these different entities that align with politicians to then just get some sort of message across that benefits that one entity, but it's not really like getting at the truth. And then we have what we have, which is like confusion. Everyone's confused, people are scared and you have to like trudge through mud to really understand like what is really, what is really going on? What's really the core? So something that's concerning then, if we put it all together, the concern is that there is the sowing of discord, instability, and dissent, which is literally the opposite of what we as unionists stand for in terms of accepting and believing that at the core there is no separation. And so I feel like this conversation has more powerfully, powerfully served its purpose today for the reason that we've actually been able to highlight very clearly the very superficial instability that is being sown. The problem is that we have people who will buy into it because they don't have, well, for lack of a better phrasing, they don't look further than their noses. They don't try and find the truth at the core. So I, I, I think it's, it's, it's very important, probably from a, from a healing point of view, that what is being shown to us is that the core of truth is the thing that probably needs to be healed a lot more than the perception of these battles and struggles and things like that. It's just that this that the truth starts to surface very powerfully. I feel like you can't really blame the Republican Party for all of the discrimination. I think there's been a lot of missing in our history so that both the Democracy Party and the Republican Party, they have benefits when it comes to like discriminating minorities. With the, the Democratic Party um, and money, welfare, there is like a kind of like incentive for that. So I, I don't think you can blame both parties, I mean, one party for what's going on. I think both parties are like, can really look past their noses to find the truth. Of course, I feel Republican parties know a lot of the truth and they're avoiding it. Whereas the Democratic party doesn't know the truth, doesn't wanna know the truth, just stands by what they think is going to be democratic but really it's not going in a very divine way so that's how i feel yes yeah, so i think this is this is probably a topic that can expand quite a bit given that there's so much more to what's actually at play here but yeah thank you to everybody for the conversation today
Thank you to the people that have been following us. Please also feel free to like and subscribe to our Church of Union YouTube channel, where you will find all our previous conversations and any other live discussions that have happened in our Unionism Spiritual Discussion Group on Facebook. And we look forward to seeing you again the next week. Thank you, everybody. Good night. And good afternoon to the people who are not in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye.